There's been a death in the room, the death of our wireless microphone. Wow, so much going on in the world around us, so much to talk about, huh? Let's see, we could talk about race relations, we could talk about the importance of the family, crime and punishment, climate change, sexual ethics, the role of government, we could talk about Marxism, religious liberty, COVID-19, or we can talk about Bruce slash Caitlyn Jenner officially running for governor of California. We could talk about those things and, uh, and more. And by the way, the Bible has something to say on all of those topics. Or we could take another approach. We could ask, what do all of these topics have in common? What's at the root of all of those subjects? And if you think about it, they all relate to life in a fallen world, a world that has been spoiled by human sin. And if that's the case, then what is God's solution to the problem of human sin? And we know the answer the gospel of the Lord Jesus Christ. If sin is the problem, that is God's solution, the gospel. And where in the Bible do we find the clearest, fullest, most compelling explanation, defense, and exposition of the gospel? The whole Bible from Genesis to Revelation declares the gospel, but perhaps there's no book in the canon of scripture that is as uh, clear and focused and compelling in terms of explaining and defending the gospel as the book of Romans. James Montgomery Boyce, he was the pastor of 10th Presbyterian Church in Philadelphia for many years and an evangelical leader. He died in 2000. He wrote, Christianity has been the most powerful transforming force in human history. And the book of Romans is the most basic, the most comprehensive statement of true Christianity. And so it is. A lot of figures from church history trace their conversion to the book of Romans. Augustine does. And Martin Luther did. We're going to talk about that more as we progress through chapter 1. Martin Luther was converted uh, as an unconverted Roman Catholic monk teaching through the book of Romans in the college uh, uh, at Wittenberg, and God saved him as he's preaching his own lectures. Uh, John Bunyan traces his conversion to the book of Romans. Um, the Book of Romans had a role to play in my own conversion, and I think that a lot of you would probably amen that. So the Book of Romans is a very powerful book, a very central book to the Christian message, and uh, I, I think that this is what our church needs right now. This is what the world needs. We need the gospel. We need to understand the saving message of Jesus Christ, what he calls us to believe and to do as Christians. And uh, I believe the Lord wants to build us up to encourage our hearts and to sanctify us as we focus on the gospel as it's presented to us in the book of Romans. So today we're going to be looking at verses 1 through 7 where we see Paul's uh, greeting to the church at Rome, to the Christians in Rome. And it's just like the book of Romans itself is amazing. Paul's greeting is amazing. You're going to see that, I trust. Verses 1 through 7 are just packed with theological truth, with 
gospel truth from the pen of the apostle Paul. Um, so as Paul introduces the, this book, introduces himself and his subject, greets his readers, he, he does so in a way that basically previews the rest of the book. And we're going to see that. And of course, the greeting itself that he brings us in verse 7, I think, is very timely to us and to our world. Grace to you and peace. That is what we need. We need grace. We need peace. And grace and true peace come through the gospel of the Lord Jesus Christ. So that doesn't mean it's illegitimate to touch on things going on. In, whoops. Oh, good. The lid, lid was on. Uh, to touch on things going on in the culture, particularly as they pertain to the church. But there's just nothing like the gospel. So let's fasten our seatbelts and let's, let's get a running start as we go through the book of uh, Romans. Um, chapter 1, verses 1 through 7, Paul's greeting to the Roman Christians. And the way we're laying this out is um, pretty much how you would send an email these days through Gmail or Outlook or whatever your platform happens to be. Um, when I send an email, it's, it's from me. You see my name. It's to whoever. And then there's, there's a subject. And Paul doesn't follow that exactly because it's, it's from, and then the subject, and then to, then he, then he gives the actual greeting. But um, that's how I'm arranging our study through this portion of God's word this morning. So first of all, from. This is a letter, and it is from somebody. So in Romans chapter 1, Brother Ron read the text already, but the from is identified really early on, the very first word, Paul. This letter was written by Paul. And of course, this is the same man that we've already been introduced to, the man whom we've met in the book of Acts. So this was Saul of Tarsus as he was first introduced to us in the book of Acts. And like other Roman Jews, Paul was a citizen of Rome, a Roman citizen, but like other Roman Jews, he was given a Jewish name, and that was Saul, Saul of Tarsus. And Paul went by his Jewish name, Saul, before his conversion to Christ, but he was also given a Roman name, Paul. And that's what he went by after his conversion. And so Paul is still the most famous convert in church history. And you remember his story. He was a persecutor of the church, responsible for the imprisonment, torture, and even murder of many Christians. But then as he was on the road to Damascus, in Acts chapter 9, actually on his way to persecute Christians there, the glorified Jesus stopped him in his tracks and saved him. And Paul was transformed from being the worst adversary of the church to its most important missionary, apologist, and minister. So that is the Paul who wrote the book of Romans. And Paul goes on to list his credentials. Why does he have standing to write a letter like this to this church? And this was important because Paul had never met most of these people before. He had never been to Rome. Uh, he didn't plant the church in Rome. And we're going to get to that, by the way, as well. But uh, notice these credentials that Paul gives in the um, words that follow. So we're given his name, Paul. Then he goes on to describe himself as a servant of Christ 
Jesus, a servant of Christ Jesus. And in our day and age, where uh, we might be apt to think about someone like a, a, a waiter or someone who's um, a domestic worker, who's, who's paid to um, work in someone else's household, that is not what Paul means when he says a servant of Christ Jesus. He uses the Greek word doulos, which is more properly translated slave. So literally, and this is what his original hearers would have, would have heard when they heard this or when they read this, Paul, a doulos or a slave of Christ Jesus. It means someone who is not their own, someone who serves a master, someone who has been bought and paid for and therefore belongs to another. And by the way, this, this concept of slavery is going to become really important as the book of Romans unfolds, particularly in chapter 6. But uh, Paul wrote to the church in Corinth and used the same imagery of slavery in chapter 6 and verse 19, where he says that um, we, we are not our own. We have been bought with a price. And that's absolutely true. Every single Christian, it turns out, is a servant, a slave of Jesus Christ. We have been purchased at the price of his own blood. We don't belong to ourselves. We belong to Jesus who loved us and gave himself for us. So Paul was a slave of the Lord Jesus Christ. Then, by way of his credentials, Paul goes on to describe himself as called to be an apostle. Called to be an apostle. And we've talked about that word apostle before, especially uh, in the book of Acts. Um, the word apostle in English is a transliteration of the original word in Greek, which is just apostolos. And the generic meaning of the word is an ambassador. It's someone who's under the authority of another and this apostolos, this ambassador, brings the message of the, the one under whose authority they find themselves. So they carry official weight. They carry official authority as the uh, officially uh, appointed and sent ambassador of another. That's what an apostle is. And we're told in the Bible that uh, there were 12 apostles. Everyone is not an apostle. All believers are disciples. We're all followers of Christ. We're all followers, learners of Christ, but we are not all apostles. There were particular men personally and specifically called by Jesus Christ to function as his ambassadors. And Paul uh, describes this same Paul describes in Ephesians chapter 2 and verse 20 that their role was to function as um, foundation stones in the church. Um, the, the rest of us are being built on that foundation that has been laid by the apostles and prophets and of course Jesus Christ himself is the chief cornerstone. So the uh, apostles laid the foundation of the Christian church. They spoke with Christ's authority, which is why Christians treat the New Testament documents like Romans. This letter that this guy named Paul wrote, we, we treat it not just as a historic document, but as the word of God. We treat the writings of the apostle Paul that are preserved in the New Testament, just like we treat the writings of Moses, just like we treat the law, just like we treat the prophets. 
in the Old Testament as the word of God. That's part of what it means to be an apostle. That carries a lot of weight. It's very significant. But notice that Paul was not a self-appointed apostle. He didn't campaign in an election and all of the churches voted for Paul. Or maybe the apostles were the top 12 vote getters. No, he was called to be an apostle by Jesus Christ himself. That was true of all of the apostles, but it was true of the apostle Paul as well. He was called to be an apostle. We're going we're gonna to come back to that word called because Paul is going to go on and point out that all believers are called not to be apostles, but to be saints. And that word called, kaleo, means to be summoned, to be called, and in this case, to be called by God. And this is not this, this general call to everyone, but it is a specific, personal call from God, in this case, to Paul to be an apostle. So, when we read these words in the book of Romans, we're to understand that these words are not just the words written by Paul, even though they are, but these are the very words of Jesus Christ with all of the weight and authority that Jesus Christ has. This is the word of God to us. Then, Paul also gives this credential that he was set apart for the gospel of God, which he promised beforehand through his prophets in the Holy Scriptures. In other words, this was God's plan for Paul from before the foundation of the world. Paul was eternally set apart to this, to serve Jesus Christ as an apostle and to be uh, a mouthpiece of his and organ of revelation, very similar to the prophet Jeremiah. All of the prophets, for sure, but Jeremiah put it this way about his own awareness of his own call. In Jeremiah chapter 1 and verse 5, Jeremiah wrote, Before, uh, God said to Jeremiah, Before I formed you in the womb, I knew you. And before you were born, I consecrated you. I appointed you a prophet to the nations. It's very interesting concerning Jeremiah. It's interesting concerning Paul. Because we were first introduced to him as Saul of Tarsus when he was a persecutor of the church. It's remarkable to think of that, that when Saul of Tarsus hated Jesus, Jesus loved him with an everlasting love. When Saul of Tarsus was trying to destroy the church, Jesus had this plan from all eternity that he would build up the church through his missionary work and his office as an apostle through the book of Romans, among others. This is what God had intended for Paul from before the beginning of time. He was set apart for the gospel. And notice that he was set apart to communicate a specific message. The gospel of God, it's called here by Paul. It's this gospel, this good news, that as we're going to see is all about the person and work of Jesus Christ. The gospel of God is not what, it's not good news about what we can do to save ourselves. If that was the case, it would be bad news. Because it turns out there's nothing that we can do to please God. Paul's 
going to go on to develop that in Romans chapter 8. Those who are in the flesh cannot please God. So the gospel of God is not what we do in the least to please God or to save ourselves. It's the gospel of God about what God does to save sinners like us. And we know that the, um, the foundation of that, the center of that, the main point of that is what Jesus has done. As the Son of God coming into the world as a true man, being just like us, except that he didn't sin, didn't have a sinful nature, and he died on the cross as a substitute for our sins. He died as the Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world, and he was raised for our justification. Paul's going to go on to develop that in the, book, in the rest of the book of Romans. But this is what God had set Paul apart for, for the message of the gospel, to be a proclaimer of it, a writer about it, a, a minister of it, a defender of it, a proponent of it, a spreader of it. That is what Paul's calling was all about. And it's a good reminder for us that this gospel, this gospel which was, which was part of God's plan, even the center of God's plan from the for the foundation of the world, which is why it was revealed beforehand, promised beforehand through his prophets in the Holy Scriptures. It is not God's plan B. God never set out to do something else, to save mankind according to their works, or to save Israel if Israel would only believe. And that failed, so then God had to turn to plan B, to go to the Gentiles with the gospel. No, the gospel, what is happening in terms of God calling out of the world a people for himself from every tribe, nation, kindred, and tongue, a people who were just like Saul of Tarsus in the sense of being enemies of God, dead in their trespasses and sins, blind to the things of God, and God calling us to himself and saving us. That is always what God had intended to do. That has been God's plan from the very beginning, from all eternity. And that was God's plan for Paul. So, from, from Paul, this Paul. Next, Paul moves on to touch on his subject. Why is he writing? What is this all about? Well, um, going back into verse 1, remember that this is all about the gospel, a, a message. He calls it the gospel of God, which is concerning, now we're in verse 3, concerning or regarding his son. So the book of Romans is concerning God's Son, the gospel, the Christian message, not surprisingly, is concerning God's Son. So the gospel of God, verse 1, is uh, concerned with God's Son, who's named Christ Jesus in verse 1. It's going to go on in verse 4 to... Uh, name him more fully, Jesus Christ our Lord. And notice what Paul says about this Jesus. He was descended from David according to the flesh. That's in verse 3. Concerning his son who is descended from David according to the flesh. And why is that important? Well, because God had promised this um, this heir to the throne of David from David's own flesh, 
we uh, have seen before the Davidic covenant in 2 Samuel chapter 7, and then um, the rest of the Old Testament scriptures, in terms of their messianic hope, always acknowledge that the Messiah, the Savior, the King is going to be from the line of King David. And when Paul says he was descended from David according to the flesh, here's Paul acknowledging the virgin birth of Jesus. That's why he says according to the flesh. It's a reference to Christ's virgin birth. And so we're reminded in Paul's greeting that Jesus had a biological mother, Mary, but he didn't have a biological father. There was no source DNA provided by any human man. It was provided supernaturally by a miracle from God himself, from the Holy Spirit. He was conceived in the womb of the Virgin Mary by the power of the Holy Spirit. But even so, Jesus was a descendant of King David through, it turns out, both Mary and Joseph. Turns out both Mary and Joseph had David's DNA in, in, in their blood, but still, uh, through Joseph, uh, Jesus could be legally considered a descendant of David because uh, Joseph was Jesus' adoptive father, and therefore he was entitled to all of the rights and privileges of his, of his son, including his genealogy. So no matter how you slice it and dice it, Jesus was definitely, legally, technically, biologically, a descendant of David. And uh, this is why Matthew and Luke, the two gospel writers who include genealogies in their gospels, they're, they're careful to point that out, that uh, the line of Jesus passes through the line of King David. In fact, the first words in Matthew's gospel are, the book of the genealogy of Jesus Christ, the son of David. Very important. Then Jesus is described like this by Paul. He was declared to be the Son of God in power. Verse 4, according to the spirit of holiness, by his resurrection from the dead. This is Paul's subject. Jesus declared to be the Son of God in power by his resurrection from the dead. So this is important because it reminds us that Jesus didn't just claim to be the word of the son of God and he did. Jesus didn't just depend on his followers to figure out that he's the son of God. Although they should have been able to figure that out. No, it was more than that. It was more compelling than that, Jesus was declared to be the Son of God by an indisputable, indisputable, utterly unique, supernatural, historical event. His resurrection from the dead. When that happened, when Jesus was raised from the dead, among other things that that accomplished, it served as a message from God, a declaration from God. Hey, everybody, take notice, God is saying. Here's what I want you to know by this incredible act. The resurrection of my son. He is my son. That's what I want you to know by Jesus' resurrection from the dead. He was declared to be the Son of God by his resurrection. And Paul, the same writer here in Romans, of course, when he was preaching as a missionary, 
in uh, Antioch of Pisidia in Acts chapter 13 and verse 33, he said this in his message. This he has fulfilled to us, their children, by raising Jesus, there's his resurrection, as also it is written in the second psalm, you are my son, today I have begotten you. That's a really interesting reference. Uh, psalm 2 is well known within the Old Testament canon as a messianic psalm. And Paul, in Acts chapter 13 and verse 33, he cites from it in that sermon to Jews, and he uh, quotes from Psalm 2 and verse 7, and says, he, he connects basically the resurrection of Jesus and the sonship of Jesus from Psalm 2. You are my son, today I have begotten you. So that's really interesting. In Psalm 2 and verse 7, when it says, you are my son, today I have begotten you, that has nothing to do with creation or becoming a son, as in, or as if there was, there was a time when Jesus was not the Son of God. Because we are told by the Apostle John that in the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. Jesus is eternal. Jesus is the eternal Son of God, just like God the Father is the eternal Father. They have eternally sustained this relationship between the two of them as father and son. So it's not that Jesus began to be God's son when he came into this world or even when he was raised from the dead. But Psalm 2 and verse 7, you are my son, today I have begotten you, means that now that fact has become public. Now this relationship between God the Father and God the Son, which was being revealed for sure during the public ministry of the Lord Jesus Christ, but now it was on full display for all of the world to see with no doubt that Jesus Christ is the, is the Son of God. It's sort of like now we have 23 and Me and other means like that, where you can find out that you have long lost relatives, or for some reason you have um, a child, a, a son that no one else knows about, and at some point you say, I want you to know this is my son. That's what's going on here in Psalm 2 and verse 7 relative to the resurrection. It's not that there were no hints of that before. Uh, God did say on the occasion of Jesus' baptism, uh, you are my beloved son and you I am well pleased. But it wasn't as public, it wasn't as emphatic, it wasn't as universal as the resurrection. And so Paul says he was declared to be the son of God in power according to the spirit of holiness by his resurrection from the dead. Then he describes Jesus in this way. He is Jesus Christ our Lord. He is Jesus Christ our Lord. That's at the end of verse 4. So we've, uh, he's been identified to us as Christ Jesus. Here, we have his proper name, Jesus, and his title, Christ, Messiah, and who he is in his essence. He is the Lord. And all those are very important. Remember, Mary and Joseph did not come up with the name Jesus. Jesus literally means Jehovah saves. And the reason why Jesus was named 
Jesus is because an angel of the Lord spoke to Joseph in a dream beforehand and instructed him to name him Jesus for he will save his people from their sins. Matthew 1 and verse 21. His name literally means salvation. Jesus. And then Christ is the Greek form of the um, Hebrew word Messiah, which means the anointed one, the, the chosen one. And very much part of the Hebrew hope, the Jewish hope from the Hebrew scriptures, was the coming into this world of the Messiah, who would rule over them and would set things straight and would be a tremendous blessing to the people of Israel as well as to the nations. The anointed one, the Messiah, the Christ. And over and over again, we're told in the Gospels that Jesus is the Christ. But then Paul also here includes the title Lord, Jesus Christ, our Lord. And that's a very important word. In the Greek, it's the word kurios. But that word in the Greek is used to translate the Hebrew word Yahweh. So in the Greek translation of the Old Testament scriptures, when the proper name, the, the uh, tetragrammaton, Yahweh, we can't even pronounce it, is used in the Hebrew scriptures, the Greek translators use the word kurios. That's who Jesus is. He is our kurios. He is Lord. He is one and the same with Jehovah in terms of his essence, in terms of his substance, in terms of his being. He's Lord. He's master. He's owner. And you'll remember that the Apostle Peter, on the day of Pentecost, when he was preaching to a um, vast crowd of Jews in the temple, Peter said, Now let all the house of Israel therefore know for certain that God has made him both Lord and Christ, this Jesus whom you crucified. So there's Peter using all three of those titles again. So, he is Jesus Christ, our Lord. And then, continuing on with his uh, subject, Jesus is described in this way, that he graciously acts according to his purpose. He graciously acts according to his purpose. So, verses 5 and 6. So, this Jesus Christ, our Lord, through whom we have received grace an apostleship to bring about the obedience of faith for the sake of his name among all the nations. That, that's a mouthful. But basically, Paul is saying that everything that we are, everything that we have in terms of Christians, in terms of being believers, it all comes from God on the basis of his grace through Jesus Christ. Jesus is the channel of every spiritual blessing, every gift from God, all favor from God, including Paul's call to the apostleship. It all came and does come through Jesus Christ. And why is that? Because Jesus earned God's favor in Paul's behalf. Jesus earned God's favor in your behalf, in my behalf. That's why every good and perfect gift comes through Jesus. God's grace did not come to Paul because of anything in Paul. He was an enemy of God, of course. The only thing that Paul deserved 
was God's wrath because of Paul's sin. But Paul received grace instead because of Jesus. And Paul was so conscious of this all the time. And this is why he wrote to the Corinthian church, but by the grace of of God, I am what I am. 1 Corinthians 15 and verse 10. And if you're a believer, the same thing is true of you. But by the grace of God, you are what you are. And for what purpose? Paul says, to bring about the obedience of faith. So these blessings of grace, these gifts and callings that Jesus gives... What is it all about? What's it all for? What's the purpose? To bring about the obedience of faith. The purpose of Christ is not just to forgive people so that they can go on living in disobedience to God. The purpose of Jesus is to glorify God's name and his own name by bringing about the obedience of faith, by transforming rebellious sinners like Saul of Tarsus into obedient saints. And this is why Jesus called Paul to be an apostle, to bring about the obedience of faith. And that, by the way, is why Paul worked so hard not just to make converts, but then to organize them into local fellowships called churches. Because we're not just supposed to run around like or as forgiven rebel rousers, children of the devil, whose lives are not changed, but we're supposed to grow in grace and to be taught all that Christ has commanded us. This is a really, this is a very similar statement uh, to what Paul relates in his testimony back a few pages in Acts chapter 26. Remember this? When Paul was relating his uh, conversion story to King Agrippa in Acts chapter 26, verses 15 through 18. So he's relating his uh, road to Damascus experience. And Jesus appears to him in a glorious form. Saul says, who are you, Lord? And the Lord said, I am Jesus whom you are persecuting. But rise and stand upon your feet, for I have appeared to you for this purpose, to appoint you as a servant and witness to the things in which you have seen uh, me and to those in which I will appear to you, delivering you from your people and from the Gentiles to whom I am sending you. And now here is Paul's mission to the Gentiles to open their eyes so that they may turn from darkness to light and from the power of Satan to God, that they may receive forgiveness of sins and a place among those who are sanctified by faith in me. That's a longhand version of what Paul says in Romans chapter 1, verse 5b, to bring about the obedience of faith. It's that. And this is what God has done in our lives as believers. He's opened our eyes. He's enabled us to turn from darkness to light power of Satan to the power of God. And yes, we have been forgiven, praise God, but we also have a place among those who are being sanctified. We're saints. There I go again, pouring over my water. So this is what God does. He transforms rebellious sinners into obedient saints. And this is why Jesus called Paul to be an apostle. So from Subject, and now to verse 7a. Who is Paul writing to? He says, 
beginning in verse 7, to all those in Rome. By the way, just to be clear, this does not mean all of the citizens in Rome, all of the inhabitants in Rome without exception, to all those in Rome, no distinction. That's not what Paul means at all. He clarifies the scope of his audience by saying, to all those in Rome who are loved by God and called to be saints, in other words, he's writing to the Christians in Rome. Now, I've already mentioned that he never visited Rome. We're going to see in verse 10 where Paul says, Always in my prayers, asking that somehow by God's will I'm, I may now at last succeed in coming to you. And in verse 13, I want you to know, brothers, that I have often intended to come to you. And in verse 15, so I am eager to preach the gospel to you also who are in Rome. He hadn't done that yet. And you remember from um, our studies in the book of Acts that probably the people who brought the gospel to Rome were Aquila and Priscilla in Acts chapter 18. And then, ironically, the way that Paul's desire and prayer to actually go to Rome and to see the Roman believers was fulfilled when Paul was under arrest and brought to um, Rome as a, a prisoner of the Roman Empire. So, to Christians, believers in Rome, and then note, notice how else he describes them, who are loved by God. Paul's going to develop this theme of the love of God, the truly unconditional love of God. In chapter 5 and verse 8, for God shows his love for us and that while we were still sinners, Christ died for us. And Paul's teaching in Romans lines up perfectly with the apostle John's teaching who wrote, we love him because he first loved us. In 1 John 4 and verse 19. To all those in Rome who are loved by God and called to be saints. Just as Paul was called to be an apostle. We as believers have been called to be saints. And I mentioned that word kaleo. To call, to, uh, to name, to summon. And uh, Paul is really going to develop this in chapter 8, verses 28 through 30, which I'll read to you, Romans 8, verses 28 through 30. And we know that for those who love God, all things work together for good to those who are called according to his purpose. Same idea of calling. This is not true of everybody without distinction that all things work together for good. How do we know that? Well, at least because there are people in hell. We can't say about people in hell that all things work together for their good. But Paul does say that all things work together for good to those who are called according to his purpose. That is God's effectual, effective, powerful, gracious, sovereign call. When he draws us unfailingly and savingly to Jesus Christ. Reading on in Romans chapter 8. For those whom he foreknew, he also predestined to be conformed to the image of his Son, in order that he might be the firstborn among many brothers. And those whom he predestined, he also called. And those whom he called, he also justified. And those whom he justified, he also glorified. Lots of people assume, well, God is calling everyone. Everyone's called. But in Romans chapter 8 and verse 30, 
There's this golden chain of redemption that reaches back into eternity past, whom he foreknew, he predestined. And foreknowledge means the same thing as God loving his people with an everlasting love. And it extends into time through our calling, our justification, and ultimately to our glorification. That doesn't apply to everyone. Jesus himself said that many are called that way, outwardly, through this general call of the gospel, but few are chosen. Paul was writing to the called, called to be saints. Peter addressed his readers in 1 Peter 2.9, But you are a chosen race, a royal priesthood, a holy nation, a people for his own possession, that you may proclaim the excellencies of him who called you out of darkness into his marvelous light. That's who Paul's intended audience was. And brothers and sisters, that's who you are. You are the called. Notice, by the way, that we are called to be saints. In Roman Catholicism, there's a whole process of canonization by which someone in their uh, communion becomes a saint. According to the Bible, as soon as you are a believer, as soon as God calls you to himself, Guess what you are? You're a saint. And so, I'm in a room today surrounded by saints. I'm in a room in the fellowship of Saint Kevin and Saint Isaac and Saint Alex and Saint Denise. Fill in the blank. If you're a believer, you are a saint. The Roman Catholic Church or any other human organization has absolutely nothing to do with that. You are a saint because the sovereign maker, creator, and providential ruler of all of the universe called you to be a saint. And so a saint you are by the grace of God. And then finally, Paul's actual greeting. Grace to you and peace from God our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ. It's the same exact greeting, by the way, in 1 Corinthians chapter 1 and verse 3. A greeting at the beginning of a Roman letter was, was customary, but as we've seen, this is way more than just a customary greeting. This greeting is loaded with gospel and theological weight. Even that word grace is loaded with meaning. Grace to you. What a great word to describe our relationship with God. We don't deserve any good thing from God. We certainly don't deserve salvation from God. We don't deserve the forgiveness of sins. We don't deserve to be called as saints. We don't deserve to go to heaven. But all of those are realities. All of those belong to us by God's gracious favor. God's undeserved favor by us. That's what it means to be saved by grace. And then everything that we have in terms of our, our gifts and our usefulness in the Christian life, all of our possessions, every good thing in life is a gift of God's grace. And then what's our desire as we live the, the Christian life, but to know more and more in our own experience and our own soul's the grace of God, that we might grow in the grace and knowledge of the Lord Jesus Christ. What a great greeting. Grace to you. And, Paul says, and peace. 
peace. And this is not just a psychological peace. Lots of people are struggling with anxiety in our culture. No wonder. If we put the Bible aside, there is lots to be anxious about in our world. And I won't even get you started. But we need peace. People need peace. Paul wishes peace. But not just the peace that the world gives. This peace is an objective peace that produces internal peace. He's going to say in chapter 5 and verse 1 of Romans, Therefore, since we have been justified by faith, we have peace with God through our Lord Jesus Christ. That is the peace that surpasses all other forms of peace. The God whom we've sinned against, the God whose wrath formally rested upon us, the God before whose throne of judgment we will one day appear is at peace with us because of Jesus Christ. That's a tremendous peace. And it's outside of us. And it's outside of current events. It's rooted in the objective reality of what God has done for his people in Jesus Christ. It can never change. No one can take it away from us. It can never be canceled. It can never be rescinded. It will never fade away. We have eternal peace through the gospel. But then I said that this objective peace produces inward peace. And you're familiar with this familiar passage, I trust, in Philippians chapter 4. Verses 6 through 7, where Paul wrote, Rejoice in the Lord always. I'm sorry, verse 6. Do not be anxious about anything, but in everything, by prayer and supplication, with thanksgiving, let your request be made known to God. And verse 7, And the peace of God, which surpasses all understanding, will guard your hearts and your minds in Christ Jesus. This peace, this peace of God which surpasses all understanding does not come to us just because we pray. It comes to us through prayer, but it is based on the person and work of Christ Jesus. And so the idea is that when we're bombarded by anxieties, we can think to ourselves first and foremost, oh, no matter what else is causing me pain, no matter what else is bringing suffering in my life, no matter what else I'm fearful of, one thing is absolutely certain, I am at peace with God through Jesus Christ. If God is for me, who can be against me? If if God has given me this, salvation by grace through faith, then will he not also with Christ freely give me all things? And also we can put our anxieties into perspective because this is why we continue to live. The reason why we continue to live is because God still has sanctifying to do in our lives to make us more and more saintly, if you will. And so all of those things that are causing anxiety in my life, actually God is intending for my sanctification, for my Christ-likeness. What a great greeting. Grace to you and peace. Not just from anybody, but from God our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ. Brothers and sisters, this is what we all need. We need grace. We need peace from God. This is what the world needs. And if you're not a believer this morning, this is what you need. You need the grace of God to save you. 
It's bad news if you're trying to save yourself, but it's good news if you finally have come to the realization that you are, in fact, exactly what God says that you are, a sinner under his wrath and in need of salvation. And the good news for you is that God saves the likes of you, sinners. And you need peace, the peace of God that comes through faith in the Lord Jesus Christ. An objective peace. Come to Jesus today and be saved. Let's pray. Lord, thank you for these incredible words that the Holy Spirit taught Paul to write. Thank you for these wonderful gospel realities. And I pray that in our own souls, Lord, we would experience more and more grace and more and more peace, the peace of God that surpasses understanding. And would you please save sinners in our midst, we pray in Jesus' worthy name. Amen.